Hello, I'm Pastor Greg, Calvary Reformed Church, and for 2021, we've been doing a study on the Gospel of Mark. We're getting close to the end of Mark. We've had a lot of teachings, but each teaching is a teaching by itself. Yes, it builds off of Mark from what we looked at the weeks previous, but each one is a, is a lesson and a teaching by itself for me and my prayers for you. With that, let's have a word of prayer. Father God, I'd ask that you give me wisdom today to edify you, God, to engage and educate your people who are watching this video. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, this week in Mark, we're, we're looking at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 14, excuse me, Mark 14. And um, um, we're looking at the, the time in the garden, the garden of Gethsemane. I'm, I always say that name wrong, but the time in the garden. I want you to think about, first off, before we look at, at Mark 14, in your own life. Social scientists tell us that there's basically three types of stress that we all have, and everyone lives with stress. Just think about the last 17 months, all the crazy stress that we've had, all the, the new type of stress. Well, the three types of stress are, number one, acute stress. That's the stress that happens right away. That's the stress where there's a serious injury, a traumatic event, a, a physical violation, sudden death. And these stresses can lead to, if we don't take care of them in our lives, PTSD. So acute is that which, which happens suddenly and then it's done. Chronic stress is that stress that is we have it within our life and it continues. It's day in and day out. And, and there is some stress that some of you have, that I have, that, that is chronically, just continually within my life. That's chronic stress. It leads to high blood pressure. It leads to insomnia. It leads to anxieties. But then there's what's the type of stress called the EU stress, EU S-T-R-E-S-S. -S. That's a good stress. That's the fight or flight kind of stress. That's the stress that, that gets us motivated to do something. That's the stress, stress that moves us forward within our lives. That's the positive stress. Well, the Garden of Gethsemane, interestingly, the word for Gethsemane means oil press. Oil press is where they would press their olive oil and press the olives to make oil, oil press. Well, if you have your Bibles, go to Mark 14, verse 32. And they went to the garden. They went to the garden. I find that interesting because we tend to see the garden as an idyllic place, like a beautiful place where Christ is at with his disciples. We see pictures about it, and, and there's pictures of Jesus praying next to the rock, and the, and the light is shining on him, and it's all beautiful. And yet, we're going to see it's not that way for Jesus. Jesus says to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray. Well, we got to know some of the history. Olive trees grow where no other plants will grow. They thrive. Olive tree plants thrive in rocky and unproductive soil. So there's a ridge, there was in the time of Jesus, a ridge that ran north-south, and it was around 200 feet higher than the Temple Mount. And this is where the garden was. So Jesus takes his 11 disciples, Judas has already left, and he takes the 11 disciples out to this garden, 200 feet over the temple, 200 feet higher than what Jerusalem was, and he could see over Jerusalem. It's interesting, we've got to go back a little bit farther now to the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah says, A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse, from his roots a branch will bear fruit. And in Matthew, Matthew 2, verse 23, Jesus is from Nazareth, and Nather, Nazareth means shoot or stump. It's interesting for the fact that olive trees can be cut down, and one of the roots will start a new tree. Right now, there are some olive trees out in the area of the Garden of Gethsemane today, which we know are 900 to 1,000 years old. But we really don't know how old they are because of their root system. That root system might have been around when Christ was in the garden. So the trees continue to grow. 
so what do we see here? Jesus is, is taking his disciples to the garden and he, you got to remember, remember this. They just had the Seder meal, the Passover meal. They ate a lot of food. Oh, they had lamb. They had all this other food. They had a lot of wine. They were singing. I don't know about you. I know I've been told that if you have a little bit too much wine, you it can put you to sleep. We're going to see that happens with the disciples. We tend to see it was an idyllic picture. But it really wasn't. Listen to this. Verse 33 of Mark 14. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So out of the eleven, he took three, and they went farther into the garden. And he was deeply distressed. He was troubled. The word here to be distressed is to be terrified. It's to have sheer terror. It's to have disorientation. I could imagine right now, and we're in prayer for our Christian brothers and sisters in Afghanistan right now, and I could imagine that most of them, or all of them, are in sheer terror and panic. What is going to happen? That's the word here for Jesus. He's in the garden, and he has a terrified, he is he has a panic. There is a disorientation. And he says, my soul is overwhelmed. It is just it breaking with sorrow to the point of death. And he says, hey, stay here. Watch and keep watch. Stay here and keep watch. So he leaves. Well, we've got to know a little bit more of the history of, of, of what's going on in the Garden of Gethsemane or, or the idea of the olive press. First off, when, when the Jewish people would pick the olives, they would crush the olives. And I'm hopefully going to be able to put a picture on it on the video for you. But, it, but it's a huge wheel which weighs about 1,100 pounds. And then the, the olives would be put in a secular area. And this wheel would be attached through a pole with a donkey. And the donkey would walk around it and it would crush the olives. And that... that that crushing of the olives, the first crushing of it, would cause a reddish hue to it. I find it interesting because in, in one of the Gospels, it says that Jesus sweat drops like blood. Reddish, reddish hue. Well then, once, that, once the olives are crushed with this huge wheel, this millstone, they're put into baskets and they go into what's called the pressing stage. Well, what's the pressing stage? The pressing stage is, is there's anywhere from three to five presses that they would do with the olives. They, they would put the olives in these baskets with little holes. They would put around a five, 600 pound weight on it and that weight would press it down. And the first oil that came out of those olives was virgin, extra virgin oil. Old Testament says that the first pressing of the oil had to go to the temple for temple usage and for the priests to use for their food. Then they would add more weight onto it and they would press it again. The second pressing was used by the people. If you own the olives, they would be sold in the markets. That pressing was, was used for cooking, for, for eating, for... And the third pressing, when it could be over a thousand pounds that they would put on the olives, that last pressing of getting every last ounce of oil out was used for making soap, used for the softening of their skin. Well, as, as I read Mark 14, just remember that. There's the different pressings that take place. The, diff the different pressings have, have a, a different purpose for the oil. And Jesus, three times, he prays. He goes a little farther, verse 35. He falls to the ground. He prays, if it's possible, Daddy, Father, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but what your will is. Don't so many of us today, we say we want our will, not his will. I say that. I say that at times, friends. And then I look back and think, what am I talking about? My will, I need to follow his will. Jesus himself says, not what I will, but your will. He goes back to the disciples. The first pressing has taken place. 
on him. He goes back. He finds them asleep. He wakes up Simon Peter, and I don't know why he singles out Peter, possibly because on the way to the garden, Peter says, I'm never going to forsake you, Jesus. Jesus says, you're going to run away. And he says, I'm not going to forsake you. I got a little fly going around here, sort of bugging me. Um, I'm not going to leave you. But Peter falls asleep along with James and John. Jesus says, couldn't you wait? Couldn't you watch for one hour? And then he uses these two words, watch and pray. And in the Greek here, it's an aorist imperative, meaning do it now, do it now, do it now, do it, do it, do it. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. Friends, a lot of us at times in our lives, I know myself, when I fall into temptation, when my attitude or actions are not in line with Father's will, it's when I'm not watching, when I'm not praying. Jesus, Jesus then says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, he went away to pray. Prayed the same thing. He came back. He found them sleeping again because, because their eyes were so heavy they'd had the Seder meal. And they were tired. They didn't know what to say to him. And then he went back and prayed again, returning a third time. Three times he went to pray. I believe there were olive presses in the garden. I believe there was a millstone in the garden showing the pressing of the olives and the pressing of the sin of the world that Jesus had on his life on his heart, on his spirit. He returned to the third time, verse 41. Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough, the hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is betrayed to the hands of the sinners. Now friends, it's interesting because there is a road close to the Garden of Gethsemane, which was a quick exit road for people to run away on and people to flee out to the desert. Christ could have taken that stress that he was having at that time and said, you know what, I am done. I am I am taking off. I am taking the easy route. I'm going to go run and hide. But he didn't. He walked in the will of the Father to be in relationship with Abba God. He took the hard path. He took the path of the pressing of the weight of the world, pressing on his life. Friends, we all, we all experience pressures, don't we? We all do. And we have different pressures from work, from home, from families, from, from businesses, wherever. And those pressures sometimes lead us to not take the right course of following the will of God. I find it interesting that humanity started in a garden, in the Garden of Eden where everything was ideally, where there was no sin, Adam and Eve. But sin entered the world, and through one man sin came, but through one man of Jesus Christ, through one man of Jesus Christ, sin is broken. My sin is broken, your sin is broken, as we give our lives to Jesus Christ. Paul says in Romans, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one, and death through one, so also death was passed on to all men, because all have sinned in the Garden of Eden. It was idyllic. It was beautiful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, it was the pressing of the sin of the world on Jesus. And his blood was shed. One day, Revelation 21 says, there will be a new garden where we will be in celebration, in relationship, and communion with Jesus Christ, the Son of God, with Abba, Daddy, Father, with the Holy Spirit. I titled this teaching Convictions, and I haven't talked about convin convictions yet, more about the stressors in life. But, but my question to you is, as we finish up, what are you, what is your, what is your convictions? For Jesus, it was to do the will of the Father, Abba, Daddy. He was convicted to do that. I pray my conviction is to love God first, love my neighbor as I love myself, to place my neighbor's needs up alongside and sometimes over myself. It's not me first, it has to be God first and my neighbor's first. Convictions. Christ's conviction took him to the cross to give us eternal life, but also to give us life here and now. What are we called to do? 
the aorist imperative. Watch and pray. I can honestly tell you, friends, that when I am watching and when I am praying about situations daily, my heart stays more in alignment with Jesus Christ. When I do it my way, my heart swivels and goes off course. Christ could have gone off course and taken that road and gone into the desert and left. He did not. He stayed the course of the Father. May my life, may your life stay the course of the Father. May we watch and pray. Watch to see what the Father is calling us to do of loving Him first and loving our neighbors as ourselves and then being in prayer about that aspect within our lives. Name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. I want to thank you for watching Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. We'll be looking at at these verses and, and I go into a deeper explanation here at Calvary Reformed Church, 7829 South 5th Street, Matamon, Michigan. Thank you and have a blessed day.